welcome to A Minder, a podcast where we summarize the latest publications on neurodegenerative disease research so that you can stay up to date with the newest findings. Every month, our team of scientists will sort and organize the titles into themes and present shortened versions of the abstracts. We'll make sure to mention the title, the journal, the first author, and the last author for each publication. Whether you're in the lab, on the bus, or cooking your meal, we hope you find this podcast helpful. Hello everyone, this is Sarah recording from Vancouver in beautiful British Columbia. It's a really hot day outside, so if you two live on this side of the world, I hope that you're enjoying the outdoors and the sunshine. Also, that's another thing you can do while listening to this podcast. In this episode, we compiled all the papers that explore how inflammatory processes contribute to Alzheimer's disease, with some papers also discussing risk factors related to neuroinflammation as well as any work done in glial cells. This is a very fun section for me because a big portion of my grad studies actually revolved around microglia and pro-inflammatory activation patterns. If you too are fascinated by these amazing cells or have a remote interest in glia, but really, they're amazing, I can tell you, you're in for a treat. Today's selection is quite diverse. We have work on astrocytes, mediators of inflammation, copper exposure and microglia, all sorts of amyloid beta aggregates and their effects on inflammation, oligodendrocytes, and even some bits on the glymphatic system. I will start with microglia, a major actor in neuroinflammation. The first paper of this series is called Alzheimer's Patient Microglia Exhibit Enhanced Aging and Unique Transcriptional Activation. You'll find it in Cell Reports, published by Srinivasan as the first author, and the last author is Hansen. Now, uh, you can note those down or just check the time on the podcast uh, because we put at your disposal a bibliography with timestamps where you can check the papers that you're interested in so you can find them and read them for more details. So back to the paper. Here, the authors wanted to see whether human microglia show a similar damage-associated pattern as the one that has been observed in AD mouse models. Using RNA sequencing, they don't find a lot of similarities between the two profiles. For example, human Alzheimer's uh, or AD microglia have an augmented aging profile and a higher expression of APOE. These differences seem specific to AD when compared to other neurodegenerative diseases. Ooh, neurodegenerative is actually the hardest word for me to say, and it's funny because it's in the name of our podcast. Anyways, um, You can find an account of the differences between human and mice AD microglia on an online database, and the link is available through the abstract itself. So check it out. Next is another paper on microglia and AD titled Microglia Dysfunction Caused by the Loss of Roe Disrupts Neuronal Physiology and Leads to Neurodegeneration. So um, just a note that Roe or RHOA, I'll just be calling it Roe. This paper was published by Sokudato, as the first author, and the last author is Ralbus, and it was also published in Cell Reports. This group looked at a specific pathway in microglia activation and tried to test how this pathway affects neurodegeneration in AD. Without the small GTPAs ROE, adult microglia were found to be spontaneously activated. This led to an increase in glutamate secretion as a result of SRC-mediated tumor necrosis factor production. However, when SRC was inhibited in these mice, remember, they lacked GTPase row A. This decreased what they called microglial dysregulation and rescued this cascading effects. I should also mention that some of the effects that were listed go beyond mechanistic changes. For example, spontaneous microglia activation resulted in loss of synapses and neurons, LTP impairment, amyloid beta aggregation, memory dysfunction, well, all because of microglia activation. Now, putting this in the context of AD, when they uh, then looked at the row A slash SRC signaling pathway in APPPS1 mice, they found that it was malfunctioning. They also observed a similar effect with exposure to low levels of amyloid beta oligomers, which are part of one of the hallmarks of AD. These observations shed light on a mechanism in microglia that can lead to neurodegeneration. I always said, microglia are awesome. They're underappreciated and so interesting. 
Still looking at Mercugli activation, the next paper is titled Biophysical Basis for KV1.3 Regulation of Membrane Potential Changes Induced by P2X4 Mediated Calcium Entry in Microglia. I'm trying to read these a little slow because of all the acronyms, so hopefully it doesn't sound robotic to you. Yeah, this paper was published in GLIA, how appropriate. Uh, first author is Nguyen, and last author is Wolf. This paper centers around KV1.3. It's a voltage-gated potassium channel that is needed for microglia activation. Blocking it seems to effectively improve cognition in AD animal models. How? This is what this group tried to look at. They used whole cell voltage clamp electrophysiology and qPCR in vitro and in vivo. They found that these channels monitor the membrane potential in microglia. If these channels are blocked, they see a membrane depolarization and, as a result, calcium does not get in as much. In case this is relevant to your work, know that they looked at the P2X4 receptors when they tested calcium entry. Also, the expression of these receptors shows sex differences, but the KV1.3 channel expression does not. Still along the lines of microglia, the next paper is titled Alzheimer's Associated PLC Gamma 2 is a signaling node required for both TREM2 function and the inflammatory response in human microglia. It was published by first author Andrion, last author is Liu Koch, and you'll find it in Nature Neuroscience. Here, the authors are interested in the mechanisms of how TREM2 regulates multiple processes. We're looking at cell survival, phagocytosis, lipid metabolism. Specifically, they focus on PLC gamma 2 signaling as an intermediate in this process. And just so you know, um, PLC gamma 2 stands for, wait for it, phosphoinositide specific phospholipase C. I'll say that only once. <laughs> they find that PLC gamma 2, much easier, is involved in various microglial functions that are altered in neurodegenerative diseases. Remember, we're speaking about phagocytosis, lipid metabolism, and that this involves signaling pathways that are dependent on TREM2 and some that are not. The next paper also looks at TREM2 and is called Microglia TREM2 variant R47H, Alzheimer's linked variant, enhances excitatory transmission and reduces LTP via increased TNF-alpha levels. It was published in eLife by first author Ren. Last author is Dad Damio. Here, the authors are interested in a TREM2 variant called P.R47H in microglia and its involvement in dementia. They use transgenic rats with this variant that express human amyloid beta. And they find that these animals have higher levels of TNF-alpha, more glutamate transmission, ouch, and no LTP. They report other findings that point at glutaminergic transmission and LTP being results of TNF-alpha level changes. So, the pathological changes that we see here seem to be caused by an increase in TNF-alpha secreted by microglia. A story to be continued. I don't know if this TREM2 variant is common, but the next paper also studies R47H. It's titled Impact of TREM2 R47H variant on tau pathology induced gli gliosis and neurodegeneration. It was published in Journal of Clinical Investigation by first author Gratuz and last author is Holtzman. Here, rather than glutamate and LTP, the author looked at microglia mediated damage in a mouse model of tauopathy. They compared mice expressing the common TREM2 variants to the ones expressing the R. 47H variant, and I found that those with our special variant show less brain atrophy. The authors also report that in this model, there was less synaptic loss, less phagocytosis, and microglia were less reactive. Therefore, a disruption in TREM2 signaling leads to less microglia-mediated damage in a mouse model of theopathy. Up next is a paper by first author Martins and last author Ajay titled IPSC derived neuronal cultures carrying the Alzheimer's disease associated TREM2. It was published in the International Journal of Molecular Sciences. In this paper, the investigator generated and characterized a model of late onset Alzheimer's disease. 
They use lymphoblast-derived induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, from patients carrying the TREM2, guess which variant? It was the R47H mutation. Uh, and also from control individuals without dementia. From their results, they found that the iPSCs differentiated into mature neuronal cultures. However, they saw that the 18 neuronal cultures showed a distinct gene expression profile. They also manipulated the iPSC-derived neuronal cultures with an A-beta-S8C dimer and observed metabolic pathways, phacosome, and immune response as the most affected pathways. They further constructed an A-beta-induced gene regulatory network and identified ER stress as a potential causal role in late-onset Alzheimer's disease. Finally, they concluded that this model could be used for future identifying potential therapeutic targets. Now, there are a few papers that focus on amyloid beta-mediated activation of microglia, starting with Fibular A-beta triggers microglial proteome alterations and dysfunction in Alzheimer's mouse models. This one was also published in eLife, and first author is Monazor, last author is Tahirovich, or Tahirovic, and in this paper we're looking at two mouse models of AD, one where APPPS1 are overexpressed and one being a knock-in of APPNLGF. A proteomic analysis uncovered a list of microglial amyloid beta response proteins, which seem to differ between cells at various stages of amyloid beta deposition. Basically, microglia are heterogeneous, and this seemed to depend on fibrillar amyloid beta assembly. The authors suggest that these higher aggregates are responsible for the alteration of microglia phenotype in AD. Still along the amyloid beta string of papers, my favorite, uh, the next paper looks at the neuroinflammation caused by amyloid beta injections and how this correlates with memory. It was published in Behavioral Brain Research by first author Shali, last author is Mabandla, and you'll find under the title Amyloid Beta 1 to 42 Lesion of CA1 Rad Dorsal Hippocampus Reduces Contextual Fear Memory and decreases expression of microglial genes regulating neuroinflammation. Whew, that was a long one. Here the authors report that contextual fear memory declines with the presence of amyloid beta caused lesions in the hippocampus, and it's noteworthy that um, it was amyloid beta 1 to 42. This decline becomes more and more apparent as days go by after the lesion. CD33 and TREM2 genes uh, the levels are also higher in this group compared to those who were not injected with amyloid beta. This points at a link between amyloid beta caused damage, neuroinflammation, and memory deterioration. Switching away from microglia towards the other big player in immune cells in the brain, astrocytes. After a short break. Okay, back at it to tackle our next section, which is centered around astrocytes. If you hear any noise, I apologize. I live in a very busy intersection here. So regardless of the time of the day where I uh, record, you'll be hearing some cars drive by. So sorry about that. I'll start with a paper titled CASR agonist or KSR uh, agonist, calcitalytic uh, NPS2143 hinders the release of neuroinflammatory IL-6, soluble ICAM-1, Vantis, and MCP-2 from A-beta-exposed humocortical astrocytes. Oh my goodness, so many... Uh, yeah, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> it was published in Cells, first author being Chiarini, and last author is Dal Pra. In this paper, you'll be hearing about calcium-sensing receptors, or CASRs, and their interactions with amyloid beta in vitro, and whether the cascade of events that ensues contributes to inflammation in AD. Among their findings, they report an increase in pro-inflammatory agents such as IL-6, ICAM-1, RANTES, uh, MCP-2. Uh, sorry, for the RANTES, it's spelled R-A-N-T-E-S, in case you haven't heard that before. When inhibiting the signaling pathway with antagonist, which 
they're also called the calcilytic in this case, this release was decreased and even suppressed in the case of IL-6. These results point at calcilytic's potential to affect neuroinflammation in AD. Next is a paper titled Synaptic Loss, ER Stress, and Neuroinflammation Emergulate in the Lateral Temporal Cortex and Associate with Progressive Tau Pathology in Alzheimer's Disease. It was published by Buchanan and Koss, first and last authors, in the journal uh, Molecular Neurobiology. Okay, in this paper, the authors look at multiple pathological features of AD, such as ER stress, synaptic transmission, and neuroinflammation over different BRAC stages. They measure postsynaptic PSD95 and presynaptic synaptophysin, cognitive scores, ER stress markers. But for the purpose of this podcast, I will highlight the findings that relate to glial cells. So if you're interested, please check the paper for the other findings. For example, the report that the astrocytic glial fibrillary acidic protein, GFAP, uh, correlated with BRAC stage and with amyloid beta markers. But they see no change in the associated aquaporin-4 and microglial IBA-1 protein. Ooh, I looked at IBA-1 a lot in my grad studies with microglia. These last two markers actually seem more associated with tau pathology rather than amyloid beta. The authors conclude that these markers, in addition to the ones I mentioned earlier, generally correlate more with tau pathology and that GFAP, and I quote, was the most robust indicator of disease progression. Now on to a paper called In Silico Analysis of the Immunological Landscape of Hippocampi in Alzheimer's Disease. It was published by, oh, there's only one author called Bachu, and you'll find it in Dementia and Geriatric Cognitive Disorders. Here, uh, the authors examined the immunological composition of hippocampi in patients afflicted with AD. They used CyberSort xRNA deconvolution on gene expression data from the hippocampi of AD patients and controls. They wanted to figure out the relative proportions of 22 subsets of immune cells. Hippocampi of AD patients had more M2 macrophages and CD8 T cells. They were also composed of significantly more active dendritic cells and significantly less resting dendritic cells than control samples. This suggests that AD-afflicted hippocampi come with a distinct immune signature and that dendritic cells may play a critical role in the pathogenesis of AD, at least within the hippocampus. If you're a proponent of the amyloid beta hypothesis, you may find the next set of papers interesting. Earlier, I presented some papers that focus on amyloid beta-mediated activation of microglia, but now I'll do the same with astrocytes. Now, a paper titled Upregulation of Alzheimer's Disease Amyloid Beta Protein Precursor in Astrocytes, both in vitro and in vivo. So they're looking at uh, a beta precursor protein. Okay. It was published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease by Liang, first author, and last author is Zhang. Here the focus is on astrocytes rather than neurons and how amyloid beta contributes to pathological changes in these cells. The authors do this both in vitro and in vivo and found that in 5X FAD mice, APP is upregulated in astrocytes in an age-dependent manner. There are also differences in the appearance of the aggregates between young and old mice. For example, in the younger mice, amyloid beta precursor protein showed up as these puncta, but actually formed disorganized structures around the plaques in older mice. I wonder if this is a parallel to the amorphous structural ligamers show versus a fibrillar shape of higher order aggregates. Huh. I'll have to read the paper to know. Anyways, the key finding here is that amyloid beta precursor protein shows differences in astrocytes depending on age and could be targeted in uh, our therapeutic efforts. Next paper is titled Protein Kinases A and C Regulate Amyloid Beta Degradation by Modulating Protein Levels of Neprolysin and Insulin Degrading Enzyme in Astrocytes. It was published in the Journal of Neuroscience Research by first author Yamamoto and last author Sobue. So still along the lines of amyloid beta and astrocytes, this paper focuses on amyloid beta metabolism, and more specifically, 
amyloid beta degradation in astrocytes. Hmm. You may know that niprolysin and insulin-degrading enzymes are part of this process. I didn't. <laughs> and here, the authors zoom in on the pathways that regulate these two enzymes. We're specifically looking at the receptor G protein-mediated protein kinase A, or short, PKA, and the protein kinase C, PKC. Do these two kinases regulate amyloid beta degradation? And if so, is this through neprolysin and insulin-degrading enzymes? Well, in this paper, the authors report that the activity of the two kinases, PKA and PKC, does affect the levels of these two enzymes, and down the path, can result in a delay in amyloid beta degradation in the case of PKA, but in the case of PKC, it would be an increase in amyloid beta degradation. In summary, this paper shines light on the mechanisms underlying amyloid beta degradation by astrocytes in vitro. Check the paper or even just the abstract for more details. Now is a paper titled Sex-Dependent Calcium Hyperactivity Due to Lysosomal-Related Dysfunction in Astrocytes from ApoE4 versus ApoE3 gene-targeted replacement mice. It was published by Laro Laramona Arcas as the first author, and the last author is Masgro. You'll find it in Molecular Neurodegeneration. Now, in this paper, still looking at astrocytes, by switching from amyloid beta to ApoE4. Here, the authors look at calcium signaling in astrocytes and whether this is regulated or dysregulated by ApoE4 in brain slices. I always found brain slice experiments cool. I tried my hand at it at the very beginning of my master's and I had not imagined how much dexterity and time goes into getting viable and healthy slices. There's not even to mention the experiment itself. Though I ended up working with cell cultures, but part of me wished I had stuck with brain slices and electrophysiology. It was so cool. So anyways, in this paper, the authors worked on hippocampal slices and found potentiation of ATP did induce a calcium response in APOE4-positive astrocytes compared to APOE3. But wait, this was only apparent in male mice, not in female mice. Flag with sex differences. The immortalized cells showed a similar pattern to male mice, which is super interesting to me, isn't it? So here, in these cells, an increase of calcium influx in APOE4 cells seem to be linked to lysosomal enriched acidic stores. This was rescued when APOE3 is expressed. Looking even deeper, the lipid composition in the lysosomes and plasma membrane of these cells differed depending on the expression of APOE4 and this seemed to affect their calcium excitability. Now remember, this was applicable or maybe transferable to male mice, but not female mice. Now, if you ever did imaging work on astrocytes, you may have used GFAP as an astrocytic marker. Uh, like I said earlier, GFAP stands for glial fibrillary astrocytic protein and seems to be detected around amyloid beta plaques. In the following paper, the authors look at GFAP expression in two different APP mouse models. They compare it with BDNF and, BNF and BDNF precursor protein. This paper is called Comparative Studies of Glial Fibrillary Acidic Protein and Brain-Derived Neurotrophic Factor Expression in Two Transgenic Mouse Models of Alzheimer's Disease. It's published by Edwards and Smith, first and last authors, and you'll find it in Clinical and Experimental Pharmacology and Physiology. That's the name of the journal. The authors find an increase in GFAP expression in older transgenic mice corresponding to the time when amyloid beta plaques start appearing. BDNF levels, however, were lower in transgenic mice. And when I say high and lower, it would be in comparison with age-matched uh, wild-type mice. However, the precursor protein for BDNF was found in lower levels in one of the transgenic mice, but higher in the other strain. Hmm, okay. The authors conclude that these findings take some of the blame away from BDNF towards neuroinflammation and astrocytes in the cognitive deficit seen in the two transgenic model studies. So not the fault of BDNF, it's neuroinflammation and astrocytes. Got it. The next paper looks at both microglia and astrocytes 
So I left it till the end of the microglia slash astrocyte section, and you'll find it published in Molecular Neurobiology by first author He and last author Yang. It is titled Silencing of LRP1 Exacerbates Inflammatory Response via TLR4 slash NF-kappa B slash MAPK signaling pathways in APBPS1 transgenic mice. Here, the authors focus on low-density lipoprotein receptor-related protein 1, or LRP1, which is an amyloid beta receptor. They find that this LRP1, uh, this receptor, is expressed at lower levels in APPPS1 mice. When this receptor is inactive, they find that amyloid beta deposition increases, as well as inflammation, and they report more neuronal and synaptic loss, cognitive decline, microgliosis, and astrogliosis. You guessed it, all pathological features of Alzheimer's disease. Some neuroinflammatory markers are also found at higher levels. We're talking about pro-inflammatory cytokines, NF-kappa B pathway activation, MAPK signaling. Therefore, it seems like LRP1 um, sensors microglia and astroglia activation. The suggested mechanism involves the TLR4 or NF-kappa B and MAPK uh, pathways. Can LRP1 be targeted for therapeutic purposes? Maybe. Now, moving on to a section on cytokines, which are signaling proteins secreted by a wide range of cells. In AD, I often find them used as markers of pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory responses of cells like microglia or astrocytes, but keep in mind that they can be secreted by other cell types as well. This paper is titled Protective Role of Cerebrospinal Fluid Inflammatory Cytokines in Patients with Amnestic Mild Cognitive Impairment and early Alzheimer's disease carrying a polypoprotein E4 genotype. It was published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease by first author Mota and last author is Marto Rana. In this paper, the authors wanted to check the levels of inflammatory cytokines in the CSF of AD and MCI patients. They report that APOE carriers that are positive for amyloid and negative for tau have significantly higher levels of IL-4, IL-6, and IL-8, as well as GCSG, when compared to those who were homozygous for APOE3 and controls. Their cognitive evaluation, however, was similar to the other groups over a 24-month period. The next paper was published in International Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry by Thomas and O'Brien. It was titled Prospective Longitudinal Evaluation of Cytokines in Mild Cognitive Impairment Due to AD and Lewy Body Disease. This group, on the other hand, looked at plasma levels of cytokines rather than CSF, like in the previous paper. The hypothesis was that cytokine levels and cognition would both decline over time. They found that the following cytokines decreased over time. Interferon gamma, IL-1 beta, IL-2, IL-6, IL-4, and IL-10 in both AD and Lewy body disease, and that five of these cytokines correlated with cognitive dec decline, all the ones I mentioned earlier, but IL-6. This points at the association between peripheral inflammation and cognition in AD and Lewy body disease, and this can be considered for therapeutic purposes. Now, the third paper in this cluster focuses on one cytokine rather than a profile, and we're looking at IL-33, which I personally don't know much about. And this is kind of the point the authors make, is that there is much to learn about it, especially in the context of CNS pathology. You will find it under the title IL-33 and its decoy SST2 in patients with Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. It was published in a journal of neuroinflammation by Saricella and Clarici, first and last author. To start, I'll break our rule of paraphrasing and will directly quote this, because this sentence made me smile. Interleukin-33 is a cytokine endowed with pro- and inflammatory properties. I don't know about you, but this reads like a medieval fantasy intro or a legal document about endowments. So <laughs> that's why it made me smile. Love it. Anyways... Uh, in this paper, the authors looked at IL-33 and its receptor 
SST2 in both the sera and CSF of MCI and AD patients. In parallel, they also measured pro and anti-inflammatory cytokine levels, just in case, because we don't know which camp IL-33 belongs to yet. They found that IL-33 levels were significantly lower in both the sera and TSF of AD and MCI patients. However, its receptors were higher in the sera. IL-1 beta, which is pro-inflammatory, was higher in the sera and TSF, and IL-10, which is anti-inflammatory, was lower. You may have noticed that IL-33 showed a similar pattern to IL-10, which is anti-inflammatory. Going even further, they also tested the effects of this cytokine on monocytes that were exposed to amyloid beta in vitro. I won't go into much detail, but what they find show that the effects of IL-33 are complex. It may usually play an, an anti-inflammatory role, um, but in AD, this role is lost. Check the paper for a full account of the findings. I think I'll definitely will, actually. That was it for cytokines, microglia, and astrocytes. Now let me tell you about some mediators of inflammation and factors involved in neuroinflammation in AD. In June, we found a few papers that focus on infections and inflammation. Aha! Let me catch my breath. I'll be back after a short break. Alright, on to infections and AD. Our first paper is titled Enduring Changes in Neuronal Function Upon Systemic Inflammation Are NLRP3 Inflammasome Dependent. It was published in the Journal of Neuroscience by Bayer, first author, and last author is Corte, or Court, I'm sorry. The authors suggest that with age, wild-type mice become more vulnerable to a peripheral immune response to LPS. Immune insult led to an impairment in the following, long-term potentiation, spatial learning, and APPPS1 transgenic mice were more sensitive than wild-type mice. And this was apparent when using LPS from different sources. Mechanistically, this seems to be orchestrated by the NLRP3 inflammasome. When the authors blocked NLRP, the changes I mentioned earlier were rescued. Boom. Hmm. In the grand scheme of things, this makes me think about the long-term effects of systemic immune reactions on brain health. Hmm. Check out the paper for more details. Another paper on infections and AD, and this one is titled Porphyf ah, <laughs> Porphyromonas. Oh my goodness. Okay, again. Porphyromonas gingivalis. Okay. And Alzheimer's disease. Recent findings and potential therapy. It was published by one author, Ryder, in the Journal of Periodontology. I have seen a few papers linking oral health to Alzheimer's. Not sure if this is a booming area of research or if I'm late to the party, but this definitely made me more self-conscious about my oral hygiene. Previous autopsies showed the infiltration of periodontal pathogen, here we go again, Porphyromonas gingivalis, in the brain of AD patients and in their CSF. Okay, so they found this pathogen in the brain and CSF of AD patients. This pathogen is responsible for periodontitis, a gum infection. Are these two related? When the authors infected the mice with this pathogen and found that they infiltrated their brain, also caused neuropathological changes associated with AD. Hmm. The authors suggest that this is mediated by gingipanes, a class of P. gingivalis proteases. They find that when they use gingipane inhibitors, pathogen infiltration decreases, as well as its neurotoxic effects. This would be a potential therapeutic candidate, maybe? Now on to factors affecting neuroinflammation. A paper they're tackling now is called Prenatal Exposure to Bisphenol A, alters the transcriptome and teractome profiles of genes associated with Alzheimer's disease in the offspring hippocampus. First author is Sukjam Nong, and last author is Sarah Chana, and you'll find the paper published in Scientific Reports. Previously, da-da-da, 
These authors show that prenatal exposure to bisphenol A or BPA, easier. So prenatal exposure to BPA in rats disrupts the transcriptome profiles of genes in the hippocampus, including some linked to AD. They now confirm that in utero, BPA exposure disrupts the transcriptome of genes associated with AD and with neuroinflammation. They show that the level of NF-kappa B protein and base 1 are significantly increased in the offspring hippocampus in a sex-dependent manner. TNF gene expression was increased as well. The authors also reanalyzed transcriptome profiling data from previously published BPA studies, and they found that the BPA responsive genes were significantly associated with top AD candidate genes. These findings suggest that maternal BPA exposure may increase the risk of AD in offspring by dysregulating genes associated with AD neuropathology and inflammation. The study points at some links between AD and autism through a shared environmental factor, and it raises questions regarding sex differences in the risk of AD. If you're interested in hearing about sex differences, you should check out our episode about sex differences in the genetic landscape of AD. It will be hosted by Marcia this month. The next paper is titled, Chronic Copper Exposure Directs Microglia Towards Degenerative Expression Signatures in Well-Type and J20 Mouse Models of Alzheimer's Disease. It was published by Lim and Kitazawa, first and last authors, in the Journal of Trace Elements in Medicine and Biology. Here again, the authors refer to previous findings and continue to add building blocks. So here we go. Previously, dun dun dun. It's like whatever I, whenever I hear previously, I think about you know those episodes and TV shows where the stars say previously, the last episode. Anyways, uh, enough of goofing around. So previously on chronic copper exposure, the authors reported on copper in drinking water as a risk factor for AD and pro-inflammatory activation of microglia. Here, they take this further and look at microglia dysfunction in wild type and the J20 mouse model of AD after chronic copper exposure. For example, the report on microglia and morphology, gene expression profile like homeostatic and degenerative genes, as well as cognitive decline. In brief, they find that chronic copper exposure does tip microglia activation profile towards a degenerative phenotype and accelerates spatial memory decline. Now, another paper on copper, and this one is titled Copper II Disrupts Autophagy-Mediated Lysosomal Degradation of Oligomeric A-Beta in Microglia via mTOR TFEB Pathway. It was published in Toxicology and Applied Pharmacology by Tam, first author, and last author is Lee. Here, the authors also look at copper and microglia function, but focus on amyloid beta oligomer clearance. They also try to uncover the underlying mechanism for these effects and test the autophagy lysosomal pathway looking at microtubule-associated protein 1, light chain 3, <laughs> so... Yeah, protein is called LC3 too, P62 protein levels, and autophagic flux. This is all done in vitro in copper-treated microglia. In summary, they find that copper exposure decreased the clearance of amyloid beta oligomers. They also report that lysosomal biogenesis and autophagic flux were dysregulated. When the authors inhibited mTOR, these changes were reversed. So it's very possible that these changes are mediated by the mTOR TFEB axis. So targeting this pathway may prove to be an effective strategy to reverse the damage done by copper exposure. If you're interested in hearing more about copper exposure and risks in AD, you can also check out our uh, Modifiable Risk Factors episode hosted by Nyla. We actually have two episodes on that topic that are already available for the month of June. Now, moving away from copper and on to cholesterol with a paper called 25-hydroxycholesterol amplifies microglial IL-1 beta production in an APOE isoform-dependent manner. It was published by Wong and Luo, 
first and last authors in the Journal of Neuroinflammation. Before I start, I should mention that cholesterol 25 hydroxylase or CH25H, it controls the production of 25 hydroxycholesterol. 25 hydroxycholesterol is an immunomodulator produced by peripheral macrophages. Okay, so here in this paper, the authors look at cholesterol 25 hydroxylase expression in human AD brain tissue and in transgenic mouse brains, and they find it to be upregulated. The same is seen in mice treated with LPS, as well as the production of IL-1 beta, a pro-inflammatory cytokine. This pro-inflammatory response is enhanced by 25-hydroxycholesterol. However, the leading cholesterol 25-hydroxylase inhibits this pro-inflammatory response. They also report different findings with microglia expressing APOE4 compared to APOE3 and APOE2. Can you guess? Well, you'll have to check the original paper for the details. All I will say is that the authors conclude that 25-hydroxycholesterol secreted by microglia mediates inflammation in the brain. And this effect is dependent on APOE expression patterns. Oh, another paper on cholesterol. This one is published in Journal of Behavioral Brain Research by Maya Goitia, first author. Last author is Soriano. And it's titled, Short-Term Exposure to Dietary Cholesterol is Associated with Downregulation of Interleukin-15, Reduced Thigmotaxis, and Memory Impairment in Mice. Here, the authors explore to what extent cholesterol contributes to AD pathology. Their hypothesis is the following. Higher cholesterol in the diet in the short term will have an effect on the neuroinflammation inflammation <laughs> that we see early on with cognitive decline. In mice, they found that a short-term enrichment in dietary cholesterol led to some changes. For example, they saw a reduction in the motion or orientation of an organism in response to a touch stimulus, also called thigmotaxis for short, but I did not know what that was called. <laughs> While long-term recognition memory was not affected, they did find a decline in short-term spatial memory. Other findings in this paper point at interleukin-15 as a key player in this process and was found in lower levels in treated mice. So IL-15 can be harnessed for therapeutic interventions in populations at risk of cholesterol dysregulation and dementia. During my grad studies in neuroinflammation, it seemed like it was all about microglia and astrocytes, especially when you add A-beta to the equation. So it was interesting to me to come across this paper, which takes to focus to dendritic cells. This paper is titled Oligomeric Forms of Human Amyloid Beta 1 to 42 Inhibit Antigen Presentation. You'll find it in Frontiers in Immunology, published by Gerike or Gerike, uh, and Ferretti, last author. Specifically, in this paper, the authors wanted to see how different oligomeric species of amyloid beta affect the immune function of microglia and antigen-presenting cells in a mouse model of AD. The model they use is APPPS1 DE9, or for short, APPPS1, and they report lower MHC class 2 levels on the surface of brain antigen-presenting cells early on in the process of aggregation of amyloid beta plaques in this mouse model. Similarly, they saw the same pattern in vitro when amyloid beta oligomers were added to dendritic cells. Based on these results, it appears as amyloid beta dysregulates immune surveillance by antigen-presenting cells. This is kind of in line with other papers I covered earlier, where the attention went towards a loss in immune activity in the AD brain, contributing to pathology. Now, a way for neuroinflammation in microglia and astrocytes and cytokines and all of that, and on to a different glial cell, which I personally don't hear much about in AD. So, I'm glad I got to cover this section. 
Introducing Dramatic Roll, the oligodendrocytes, the makers of the myelin sheath. There seems to be an association between amyloid beta and oligodendrocyte death, and this is part of the focus of the first paper of this cluster. It was published in the Journal of Neuroscience Research by Ferreira and Colin. It's titled, Amyloidosis is associated with thicker myelin in increased oligodendrogenesis in the adult mouse brain. This paper explores the effects of amyloid beta on oligodendrocyte progenitor cells in transgenic mice harboring familial AD point mutations. If you're interested, they're using the J20 mo model. The authors report that in these animals, the density of hippocampal oligodendrocyte progenitor cells was normal. They also looked at the membrane properties, like the response to kinase or kinase, also normal. However, they were more responsive to GABA, and there were some structural differences. For example, the nodes of Ranvier were shorter, the paranodes were longer, and the myelin sheath was thicker in the transgenic mice. As the mice aged, some other differences started to appear in the transgenic model. For example, oligodendrogenesis increased, but the authors speculate that these cells were needed for cell replacement because the total number of oligodendrocytes remained stable. Hmm. Now, the next paper looks into a very similar question, but using the triple transgenic model of AD. This one is titled, Disruption of oligodendrocyte progenitor cells is an early sign of pathology in the triple transgenic mouse model of Alzheimer's disease. It was published in Neurobiology of Aging by Van Zulli, first author, and last author is Butt. The findings here are a little more complex, so I will only highlight a few. The authors in this paper, like the previous one, also look at oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. They report that with age, myelination does decrease, and they see a decrease in myelin basic protein in the hippocampus. Plus, the authors also find morphological differences in oligodendrocyte progenitor cells at various stages of the disease, starting with atrophy, then hypertrophy later on, and hypertrophic oligodendrocytes progenitor cells were found around and amongst amyloid beta plaques. In conclusion, they suggest that changes in oligodendrocyte progenitor cells can be seen early in Alzheimer's disease pathology and may cause myelin loss and cognitive dysfunction. Okay. Have you heard of the glymphatic system or glial lymphatic? It is important for waste clearance, and it has received some attention in the study of Alzheimer's disease. For example, it helps in the clearance of peptides like the infamous amyloid beta for brain parenchyma. It's more active during sleep or under certain anesthetics. Gee, a reminder of why sleep is important. This is the focus of the next two papers and the last two of this episode. Not sleep, but the glymphatic system. I hope you're not asleep. <laughs> so the first one is published in Scientific Reports by Valness, first author. Last author is Mardell. It is titled Apparent Diffusion Coefficient Estimates Based on 24-Hour Tracer Movement Support the Glymphatic Transport in Human Cerebral Cortex. The authors state that the glymphatic system hypothesis is controversial in terms of biochemical evidence versus what we see at the macro level with bulk flow. Here, they want to further our understanding of the bulk flow and its role in diffusion. This is an MRI study that uses CSF tracers, and this is quite far from my personal area of study, so I will keep my summary brief lest I mislead you. They report on the apparent diffusion coefficient as an indicator of brain geometry, CSF flow, and transport over time. Their findings suggest that when looking at transport, there may be other mechanisms involved, not only diffusion. If this is your area of study, check the original paper. This is a good time for me to remind you of the bibliography we put at your disposal, sign up to our mailing list, and you will gain access to the list of titles covered here with timestamps. Now, if you study the glutamatergic system and are interested in detection methods, the next paper may be for you. 
It's titled Light Sheet Fluorescence Microscopy of Optically Cleared Brains for Studying the Glymphatic System. It's published in the Journal of Cerebral Blood Flow Metabolism by Bichet, first author, and last author is Lundgaard. This group uses light sheet fluorescence microscopy to compare sleep and awake mimicking, ah, awake mimicking anesthesia. Remember, the glymphatic system is more active during sleep and under some anesthetics. The authors are, use optically cleared murine brains for the study and successfully report on some differences between the groups in terms of CSF flux and tracer influx in the middle cerebral artery, amongst other things. So this method seems adequate to quantify glymphatic system function in whole brains. This concludes this episode on neuroinflammation in glial cells. It was a long one, but I hope you found some valuable pointers to papers relevant to your work. Until next time! That's it for this episode. A huge thank you to the team that is working on sorting, summarizing, and scripting these abstracts, as well as the operations behind Aminder. The music is from Journey of a New Transmitter by Nusha Kamesh, musician and fellow scientist, and a member of the Aminder team. You can find the original piece and her other music on SoundCloud under Anusha Kamesh or on her YouTube channel, AK Music. Interested in joining the team? Give us a shout! We can always use help with content development, podcast editing, advertising, and you can be part of a new and exciting venture. Reach us by email at aminderpodcast at gmail.com or follow us on Twitter. Oh, we're also on Facebook now. Don't forget to subscribe to our mailing list if you want access to the bibliography for each of our episodes. The references come with timestamps. Hmm, timestamps. So you can more easily locate the paper that caught your interest. Check our notes below for details on how to sign up. And very close to this, you'll also find a link to our feedback survey. Because, yeah, your feedback matters to us. So please, pretty please, let us know how we can make this podcast a better tool for you. And last but not least, thank you for tuning in with us. And on this note, we hope you found our podcast useful and accessible. Until next time.